real world games can be very complicated. So in game theory, we often learn about toy games. We often study these so-called toy games. So what are toy games? They are very simple games that describe a certain kind of a strategic situation. So let's look at a few toy games. Here's the first one. It's called Bach or Stravinsky. Who are the players? Anne and Bob. And what are their choices? They can either choose to go to the concert where Bach will be played or to the concert where, where Stravinsky will be played. Now, Anne and Bob um, have not agreed in advance which concert they go to. So they make their choices independently. Uh, what are the payoffs? If they both go to the Bach concert, Anne gets two, Bob gets one. Remember, these numbers don't necessarily mean anything, except it's important which number is larger for each individual player. So, for instance, for Anne, if they both go to the Bach concert, her payoff is two. But if she goes to Bach and Bob goes to the Stravinsky concert, her payoff is zero. So that means we know she would rather have them both go to the Bach concert than her going to Bach and Bob going to Stravinsky. All right, so let's uh, uh, complete our description of the payoffs. Um, if Anne goes, goes to Stravinsky and Bob goes to Stravinsky as well, so they go to the same concert, Anne gets a payoff of one and Bob gets a payoff of two. On the other hand, if they go to different concerts, so Anne goes to Bach and Bob to Stravinsky or the other way around, they both get a zero. Okay, so let's pause for a moment and think about what these payoffs really mean. They both get zeros if they go to different concerts, but they get positive payoffs if they go to the same concert. That means they would like to go to the same concert. They would both like to end up in the same place. But one of them cares more about Bach and the other cares more about Stravinsky. Can you tell which one? Look at Anne. Her payoff if they both go to the Bach concert is two, but if they both go to Stravinsky, it's only one. For Bob, it's the other way around. So here's how we could summarize the payoffs in plain English. If they go to different concerts, they really don't like that. So they would prefer to go to the same concert. But Anne would prefer if they both went to Bach, and Bob would prefer if they both went to listen to Stravinsky. Okay, so that's a toy game. It's a simple game and it describe a describes a certain kind of strategic situation. So let's analyze the game. Okay, um, if you were a Bob, what would you do? Well, um, there are two possibilities. Anne might go to the Bach concert or the Stravinsky concert. For Bob, if Anne goes to the Bach uh, concert, going to Bach would give a payoff of one and going to Stravinsky would give a payoff of zero. So Bob would go to the Bach concert if he knew that Anne was going there too. On the other hand, if he knew that Anne was going to the Stravinsky concert, he would also go to the Stravinsky concert to get two instead of zero. For Anne, if she knew that Bob was going to the Stravinsky concert, then she would also go to the Stravinsky concert. And if she knew that Bob was going to listen to Bach, she would do the same because she would want to end up in the same place with him, um, especially since she really likes Bach. So do you see any dominant strategies in this game? For Anne, what she does actually depends on what Bob would do. She would prefer to be in the same place. Same for Bob. So there really are no dominant strategies in this game. Um, what would we expect the outcome to be then? Uh, can we not make any prediction as to what we think is more likely to happen in a game like this? Well, let's think about the different possible outcomes. For instance, if Anne were to go to the Stravinsky concert and Bob were to go to the Bach concert and just before the concert begins they realize that they are in different places, would they try to change their choices? Well, Anne would rather be in the same place with Bob, so she would want to, and Bob would want to as well, so they would not be happy with that kind of outcome. They would probably want to change their choices. Um, and that's true if they end up at different concerts, whichever ones, the, whichever concerts those are. On the other hand, if they were both to end up at the Stravinsky concert, would either one of them want to change their choice? Anne would rather be at, uh, listening to Stravinsky, even though she doesn't like Stravinsky that much, than listening to Bach on her own without Bob. So she wouldn't change her choice and neither would Bob, which means actually that's kind of a stable outcome in the sense that if they both chose Stravinsky, neither would want to change their choice. That is the very definition of Nash equilibrium. So a Nash equilibrium outcome is one where no player would want to unilaterally deviate from that outcome.
In other words, given what the other player or players do, each player would want to stick with their choice and not change. Are there any other outcomes like that in this game? Well, take a look at Bach and Bach. If they both go to the Bach concert, would either one of them want to change given that the other player is going to the Bach concert? The answer is no, they would both want to stick with that choice. So that means in this game we actually have two Nash equilibria. Yeah. Bach and Bach, or Stravinsky and Stravinsky. So that was the Bach or Stravinsky toy game, and this, it describes a certain kind of strategic situation. Um, of course it's very simple, but that's exactly why we are studying it. That's exactly why it's a toy game. Um, it's a simple way to understand a certain kind of strategic situation. Let's look at the next toy game, which is called Matching Pennies. The players are Anne and Bob, and they can choose heads or tails. So each one is holding a penny, and they decide to put it down on the table, heads up or tails up. Um, so the payoffs in this case are as follows. If they both choose heads, then Bob pays Anne a dollar. So he gets a minus one, she gets a plus one. If they both choose tails, again, Bob pays, pays Anne a dollar. But if they choose different sides, um, Anne chooses heads, Bob chooses tails, or the other way around, then Anne pays Bob a dollar. So she gets a minus one, and he gets a one. Okay, well, are there any dominant strategies in this case? If um, Anne were to choose head and Bob knew that, then he would want to choose tails because remember, she pays him a dollar if they choose differently. On the other hand, if Anne were to choose tails, then Bob would want to choose heads because again, he wants uh, them to choose differently so that she pays him a dollar. Of course, Anne wants them to choose exactly the same thing because in that case, Bob would pay her a dollar. So if she knew that Bob is choosing heads, she would want to choose heads as well. And if she knew that Bob is choosing tails, then she would also want to choose tails. So are there any dominant strategies in this game? Well, each one would choose depending on what the other player chooses. And um, to be uh, precise, Anne is trying to match Bob's choice, and Bob is trying not to match Anne's choice. So there really are no dominant strategies in this game. Well, what about Nash Equilibria? So let's look at, for example, heads and heads. In that case, would both players be happy with their choices given what the other player does? Well, Anne would be happy. Given that Bob is choosing heads, she would want to choose heads as well. But Bob would not be happy. Given that Anne is choosing heads, he would rather choose tails. So head head is not an Ash equilibrium in this game. What about heads tails? In that case, would Bob be happy? Yeah, he, he would be happy, because if Anne were to choose heads, he would be happy choosing tails. But Anne would want to change, because if Bob is choosing tails, she would want to choose tails as well, so that they match. She's trying to match, Bob is trying not to match. Well, for tails tails, again, Bob would want to change his choice, because he's trying not to match. And for tails heads, Anne would want to change her choice, because she's trying to match. So it looks like in this game, there are no Nash Equilibria. And that's kind of true, in that there are no pure strategy in Nash Equilibria. In other words, there are no Nash Equilibria in which each player chooses one of their available actions. There are so-called mixed strategy Nash Equilibria, or a, uh, there is a mixed strategy Nash Equilibrium. A mixed strategy would be one in which a player doesn't choose one of the actions, but actually chooses to randomize between the available actions. So for instance, and instead of choosing the heads or the tails side of that coin, would just flip that coin and in effect choose heads or tails with probabilities one half and one half. So we'll talk about mixed um, strategies and mixed strategy Nash equilibria um, in another video. All right, our last toy game is Stack Hunt. The players in this case are two hunters and they both can make a choice either hunt for stag or hunt for hare. If they both go and hunt for stag, the two of them can handle the stag and they get a payoff of two, which is really the highest payoff they can possibly get. If they both go hunt hare, they don't need each other for that, but of course um, that's um, less meat as well. So they can each hunt hare separately, 
And if they go and do that, they each get a payoff of one. Interestingly, if Hunter 1 chooses to uh, hunt Stag and Hunter 2 chooses to hunt Hare, then Hunter 1 is not is actually not going to get anything because he would really need Hunter 2 to uh, hunt Stag, but Hunter 2 is off hunting Hare for herself. So she would get the 1, which is the payoff for hunting Hare. Um, on the other hand, if it's Hunter 1 who abandons Hunter 2 and Hunter 2 hunts Stag, but Hunter 1 goes for Hare in the meantime, then Hunter 2 gets nothing and Hunter 1 uh, gets the hair, which is a payoff of 1. So that's the game. Let's analyze it. What would these players do? Um, if Hunter 2 uh, decided to hunt Stag, what would player 1, Hunter 1, do? Well, in that case, it would be better to hunt Stag and get the payoff of 2 instead of the payoff of 1. On the other hand, if Hunter 2 were to hunt Hare, player 1 would want to do the same too because really there's no point in trying to hunt Stag by himself. So Hunter 1 would actually try to match what Hunter 2 is doing, and Hunter 2 would also want to match what Hunter 1 is doing. So they would try to match each other, um, which means there really are no dominant strategies in this game. Are there any Nash equilibria? Well, let's see. Stag Stag would be an outcome where Hunter 1 would not want to change his strategy because hunting stack together is really the best thing that they can do. So he wouldn't want to change. Hunter 2 wouldn't want to change for the same reason. So that actually is a Nash equilibrium, a pure strategy Nash equilibrium in this game. Are there any other Nash equilibria? Well, Hair stag would not be a Nash equilibrium because Hunter 2, realizing that Hunter 1 is going for Hair, would also want to hunt hair instead and get the one instead of the zero. What about hair hair? Well, in that case, would either one unilaterally deviate to hunt stag? No, because they would get a zero instead of a one. So both hunters are happy given what the other hunter is doing, and therefore hair hair is also a Nash equilibrium. So this game has two uh, pure strategy Nash equilibria. Okay, so uh, we have seen a few toy games by now. The first one um, you really saw in an earlier video, which is The Prisoner's Dilemma, maybe the most famous game. And we could describe it um, in very broad terms as a game in which there is a suboptimal dominant strategy equilibrium. So players choose, have dominant strategies and choose their dominant strategies, but end up in a suboptimal outcome as a result. Bach or Stravinsky is really a coordination game. Uh, both players are trying to end up at the same concert. Matching Pennies is a game that has no pure strategy Nash Equilibria, and it is also what's called a strictly competitive or zero-sum game. If you remember those payoffs added up to zero, uh, whatever the outcome was, uh, because essentially either Bob paid Anne a dollar or Anne paid Bob a dollar. And finally we saw Stag Hunt, in which there's a best outcome when both hunt stag, and that's kind of competing against the safe choice. The safe choice is hunting hair because you get a payoff of one no matter what. We study these toy games because they give us an easy way to understand certain types of strategic situations and to analyze those strategic situations. And they also give us a language. So when we see that kind of strategic situation, a certain type of coordination game, for example, we can say, hey, that's like Bach or Stravinsky. Or when we say a certain strictly competitive game um, that is like matching pennies, we can just say that's like matching pennies and we all know what we, what we are talking about.